Yo guys, what is up? Here we are with another reading video, and we are all the way on chapter 23. We are almost done with the book. We have chapter 23, chapter 24, and chapter 25, and then we are done with the book, and we are going to be on our next book, and I am so excited. Um... Okay, I've lost my enthusiasm. <laughs> Sorry if I seem a little bit out of it. In real life, I have not record, I have not made a video in two weeks because I have just been busy these past two weeks. Even though I know that I've been getting videos up because with the hurricane that has happened in real life pretty recently, I've had a lot of time to make videos because there's not been that much else to do. So yeah, I'm really excited. We are on chapter twenty-three. And if I can find my chapter, chapter 22, there we go, chapter 23, okay, so I am almost assured, oh, no, I am not assured, but I am pretty sure that our next book will be the opposite of this about on the Japanese side. Because my birthday is coming up. Christmas is coming up. So there will be plenty of gift giving and opportunities to get the book. Along with a new headset to get my audio way better. Because right now I'm just using a laptop to show your audio. And I want something better. So, without further ado, let's get into chapter 23. The Only Thing to Fear by Caroline Tong Richmond. Chapter 23. The next three days blurred into one exhausting pattern. Run, rest, eat whatever they could forage, then get on the move again. Or else the Nazis would hunt them down. Right after they had left the White House, Zara had used the wind to carry them over Dominic's cigar factory, hoping to land and find a few friendly faces. But she only saw police lights, blinking around the building. Their safe house had been compromised. So they had to keep going. Their new destination was an Alliance location in Wardensville, West Virginia. To find the small town, Bastian had broken into a car late one night and stolen a map out of his block, out of its glove box. During the day, Zara and Bastian took turns sleeping and searched for water. And search, Zara, and, Zara and Bastian took turns sleeping and searched for water and food, stealing strawberries for a farm from a farm, or snatching a half-eaten sandwich from a trash bin. At night, they hurried along the side of roads. Their ears always perked for the chop of the helicopter wings. Or an incoming car. They were exhausted, hungry, and sweaty, but at least they remained one step ahead of the Germans. Zara hadn't dared fly again after that first night, with every sentinel soldier searching for them. She felt too vulnerable in the skies, especially after the Nazis had released their fighter jets. So they kept to the roads, even if it would take them days to cross the hundred miles between New Berlin and the Alliance headquarters. They didn't know where else they could go. Despite the grueling pace, Bastion hadn't complained, even though Zara noticed the weariness in his eyes and heard the growl of his hungry stomach. Maybe he was too hot, exhausted to protest. Four days in, they hid themselves in the Appalachian wilderness as a troop of sentinels circled over the forest. Zara only wanted to stay a couple of hours before heading out, but her ribs still throbbed. They had been badly bruised, according to Bastion's assessment, and fatigue swiftly overtook her. She woke in the darkness, the moon hanging in the clear night sky. Around her, crickets sang and locusts chirped. She heard no aircrafts and saw no searchlights. And Zara let her senses relax. If only for a minute, she could shut off her mind. The same thoughts invaded her head every time she had second to breathe, seconds, a second to breathe. Thoughts of Dieter, of his lifeless face. Lifeless because of her. She'd killed the most powerful man in the world and Zara's chest felt heavy at the warring emotions inside of her. She didn't exactly regret what she had done. No, the fewer had to die. There was no question about that. But she thought she would feel different somehow. Elated, triumphant. Instead, Zara could only think about who, who lay ahead of them. Once the Alliance got a hold of her assassination tape, everyone in the territories and beyond would know what she had done. They would know her name, and thinking about that made her a little sick to, sick to her stomach. Zara turned over to find herself face to face with Bastion. He had huddled closer to her in his sleep, his breath slow and deep. As she watched his chest rise and fall, she nudged aside her thoughts of the fear. They had to get to safety first. That was the most important thing right now. 
and she would have to deal with her splintered thoughts later. Bastian groaned, and Zara rested her hand on his shoulder. Uh, Shoops, I lost my thing. Only a few weeks ago, she remembered tensing whenever he neared her, but now his face hovered so close to hers, her own, and she didn't pull away. She didn't want to pull away. And that made her wonder what Bastion would want. Would he mind their closeness? Her hand on his arm? It doesn't matter, a voice clucked inside of her. Here they were, on the run for the Nazis, both of them dirty, hungry, and tired. They had still had 20 miles to go before they reached the Alliance headquarters, so all this wondering about Bastion would have, would have, should have been the last thing on her mind. But here in the stillness, with the Nazis far away, and Bastion so close, Sarah wondered about it anyway. Bastion stirred and groaned in his sleep. Mother, he said in German. Mother, run! Bastion, she shook her shoulder. Bastion, wake up! His eyes fluttered open. He blinked from Zara to the treetops and back again. The peacefulness of his deep sleep had, complete, had disappeared completely from his face. How long have I been out? I have no idea. I fell asleep too. She stretched her sore back. You should try to get some more rest. I don't think I can right now. It was only a nightmare. I'm sure your mother's fine. Zara thought about all the time she had awakened Uncle Red from his own dreams. She clung to the hope that she was alive, that he and Alina had escaped. They hadn't. Panic started to build in her chest. So she buried these questions deep inside of her, just as she had done with her thoughts of killing the fear of her. One of these days, she would have to sort through all the memories, but not tonight. It would be far too much for her right now. The Nazis were chasing her in my dream, Bastion said as he sat up. He rubbed his eyes, but the fear had rooted inside of them. Because of me. Because of what I've done. If they hurt her, they won't. His tone sharpened and he sprang to his feet. We don't know that for sure. She's going to be alright, Bastion, Zara said, standing to meet him. You don't know that, he burst out. His chest heaved. What if I? What if they kill her for raising a traitor? It'd be all my fault. Zara stilled. He never snapped at her like this before. Not once. She felt an overwhelming help, helplessness well up inside of her. I don't think the Nazis could kill your mom. Would kill your mom. If they did, they would have to kill your father too, right? And they let him attend the gala. His head hung, hung low. Maybe. The anger had already retreated from his face. Shh. I'm sorry. These last few days, she couldn't blame him for lashing out. They had been on the run for a while, surviving on snatches of sleep. And now he looked he looked so small against the fifty foot tree surrounding them, like a frightened child. Without thinking, Zara leaned forward and wrapped her arms around him. Because she didn't know what to say, she was so, and she was so tired of running day after day, hour after hour. Slowly, Bastian's hand settled around her waist, and he tucked her head into the and she tucked her head into the curve of his neck. She felt his fears t fall on top of her head. And soon she found herself crying too. All of the emotions she had bottled up, the worry for her uncle, the fear of getting caught, poured out in a torrent. It's okay, she heard Bastion whisper to her. It's okay, Zara. He held her, rocking her until her eyes dried, until his shirt was wet from her tears. That was when Zara pulled back from him, embarrassed. I'm sorry, your shirt, it's only a shirt, and it's pretty wrecked already. He glanced downward, taking in the dirt stains and rips on his t-shirt. Then, in no spite of everything that had happened to them, he gave her a small smile. You, <coughs> excuse me. You can buy me one later. She smiled back wanely and punched him in the shoulder, but his hands remained fastened around her. They were standing so close, their faces lingering inches apart. Bastion reached out and tucked her, air behind his, her hair behind her ear. Zara, I, her heartbeat rocketed. She couldn't skyrocketed. She couldn't find her voice. Bastian's chin tilted down, and his lips brushed against hers. Shyly, nervously, Zara leaned her mouth into his, into his softly at first, tasting his breath, tasting him. Goosebumps tick tickled over her skin as his fingers brushed across her neck, then trailed down her back. He pulled closer, and Zara was and Zara startled at first. And Zara froze, startled at first. But she took his lead and sank into him. A throw shot through her, shivering down into her toes. 
One hand wove through his hair, and the other curled around the back of his neck. For a few precious seconds, the exhaustion flew from her body. She anchored herself to this kiss, to him. Bastion pulled back his head suddenly, and Zara wa wondered what she had done wrong. She he blinked at their feet. Were floating. Zara must have looked. Zara looked down to find them hovering three feet in the air. She must have summoned the wind without even realizing it. I'm sorry. She was about to bring them back to ground, but Zara caught her hand. I don't mind, he said, leaning back down toward her mouth. But the chop of a helicopter wings broke them apart, sending them sprawling to the ground as Zara lost focus. With her head still filled with their kiss, she pushed through the haze to look at the helicopter. She found its lights in the distance, circling over a trail they had passed, her body tightening like a bowstring. We better get going, Bastion said, crawling up beside her. In case they come toward us, Zara nodded, and he helped her to his to her feet. Bastion's hands lingered on hers, and she didn't let go of it. We'll keep heading west. The sun sets the, the sun set over that ridge. She tried to focus on their escape route, but she wanted to stay in the shadow of those trees. She could forget about the Nazis and their helicopters if if she only shut her eyes. Lead the way, said Bastion. At last, he dropped her his hand against his side. And Zara stepped in front of him. She focused her feet forward and shook the remaining haziness from her head. They had to keep moving if they wanted to survive. They started their slow march through the brush, and Zara didn't let herself look back. When they finally reached the tiny town of Wardensville, they were both starving and caked with grime. Their map was now tattered and torn, but it had led them here, where the Alliance headquarters were located. Dawn broke over the horizon as they scaled the hill that led to an old Victorian hotel, bearing the address that the garrison had told Zara so many nights before. She wanted to spring up the hill and call out for her uncle, but the last few days had sapped the life from her bones. The hotel had seen barrier days. Its violet paint had faded to a sickly lavender, and some of the window panes hung crookedly off their hinges. A thick leaf forest surrounded the building on all sides. When they reached the front porch, Zara read the sign that greeted them. Welcome to the Hotel Liberty, established 8, 1875. For a second, she hesitated. They had avoided civilization since the assassination, and she was struck with the sudden fear that the Nazis had discovered the bunker and were setting a trap. But then she felt Bastian's hand on the, at the small of her back. Since their kissed, he had been doing that more and more. She knew most of it was out of necessity taking her hand when they crossed the muddy creek, or pulling her boots off at night when she was too tired to do it herself. But there were other times when she felt his hand on her shoulder, or his arm curling around her before they gave in to their exhaustion. She never pulled away. Out in the woods on the run, Bastion's touch became her anchors whenever the field jolted through her, or the punker, hunger pains rooted deep in her belly. I'll go first, said Bastion. No, we'll go together. They'd done everything together since leaving the White House. She didn't see why they had to stop now. They approached the steps, but a young man stepped out into the porch, motioning for them to stop. He looked over their ragged clothes, their hungry faces. I'm sorry, the hotel is closed for renovations. Please, Zara croaked. Her thirsty throat screamed for water, and she racked her memory for what Zara had said to her before the White House attack. He said to her to say something when she arrived here. What was it? The the birds will chime at midnight? Well, he flooded the man's face and he ushered them inside. I thought I reckon you, recognized you from the television report on Channel 7, but I had to make sure. Standard procedure. I'm on TV, Zara breathed. The Nazis got a picture of you from the White House security footage. It's all over the radio broadcast, too. But his voice trailed off. That's more than I should have said. The others will fill you off. And can I shake your hand, Miss St. James? Zara stared at him, then at his hand. No one had ever asked this question before. The Greenfield clean who didn't even want the Greenfield clean who didn't even want to touch a commie like her. She raised her own hand weakly, and the young man grasped onto it and shook it hard. What was on the television reports? What what was on the television reports? Yes, what have you heard out of New Berlin, Bastion said. They'll explain everything in the debrief. I'm sorry, but I'm not authorized to say much else. Then the man hurried into a dusty receptionist's desk, 
where he accessed a hidden keypad and punched in a long string of numbers. A trap door hissed open by his feet, revealing a metal, metal ladder into the Alliance's secret bunker below. Clark, we have company, he shouted. He motioned at Zara. You can head down now. Watch your step. Zara climbed down the steep ladder and stumbled into a narrow corridor that re resembled a submarine. Metal walls, flickering lights, and steel doors that echoed, echoed with every boot step. She braced herself against the cold wall, her head woozy from thirst and hunger. A woman ran up to her, introducing herself as Mar Margaret Clark. She took Zara by the arm. Careful now, said Clark. What's your name? Recognition flared in the woman's eyes when she saw Zara's face. Zara St. James, you made it out? We've been waiting, waiting for days for you. Is my uncle here too? Redmond St. James? I have to check the roster. Well, let's get you to the infirmary first. Clark's gaze flickered over Bastion. We'll have both of you checked out and fed a square meal. I, I'll find Murdoch too. I'll, I know he'll want to speak. Zara didn't hear the rest of what Clark was saying. Despite the blisters on her feet, she took down the hall, shouting for her uncle. Dozens of faces popped out metal doors, but none of them were Uncle Red. Zara, wait! Bastion shouted behind her. She ignored him, too. Uncle Red, she cried. A tremor shook through her thin shoulders. He had to be somewhere. Aline had to have gotten him out. But what if she hadn't? Uncle Red! Her voice was breaking apart. But then her tired gaze fixed on a man running towards her, his face obscured by the dim lights. He sprinted toward her at full speed, completely barefoot. His shoulder and upper arm wrapped in bandages. And then he was hugging her with his good arm. Zara! Oh, God! It was him! It was Uncle Red! He engulfed her in an embrace, rocking her back and forth like when she was little and had skinned her knee. You're okay! She said to him, she said into his shoulder over and over again. She buried her face against him, so relieved to find him alive. Alive. Aline brought me here. I've been so worried. His hands gripped her shoulders, making sure she was real. That might be the last mission you ever go on. Zara laughed through her tears. Yes, sir. Uncle Red looked past her shoulder and extended a hand towards Bastion. We've been worried about you, too. Welcome back. Did Aline make it, too? There... Zara said, did Garrison? The smile slid from Zara, Uncle Red's face. Let's get you two to the infirmary first, and Murdoch will tell you everything. They're okay, aren't they? Uncle Red only wrapped her arm around her. What matters is that you're okay, right now. That is enough. No, that is that you're okay. Right now, that is enough. Zara knew that he was avoiding her question, but she was too tired to press him on it. Her uncle was alive. She and Bastion had made it to safety. That was all that mattered for now. Let's get you to the infirmary, okay? Uncle Red said gently, keeping his arm around her. I'll show you the way. After her and Bastion's medical checkup, they were given a meal of boiled carrots and potatoes and allowed hours of drowsy sleep before they were fully de debriefed. Zara and Bastion were spared no details. Right after the, ra the raid on the White House, New Berlin had collapsed into chaos. Riots overtook the cities, factory workers and day laborers, Thousands upon thousands ransacked the three st streets I can't talk, and set fire to the government buildings, inspired by the Alliance's attack. Murdoch, the new head of the Alliance, had broadcasted the guerrilla battles, battles as well as the raid on the White House on Channel 13, a channel well known for its scandalous soap operas and a game show reruns. It wasn't Channel 7 by a long stretch. Security of the news channel had tightened significantly after the Fort Goring debacle. It was the best the Alliance could do. Despite the smaller viewership, the, the video had spread like an oil slick. It had poured from one channel to the next, playing on live television on the, and on the radio. This Operation Burning Eagle had been a total success. Now its efforts were, pre were spreading across the territories. Uprising had popped up in all major cities, from Boston to Atlanta and to the factories of Chicago. The riots gained even more favor at the news fervor, F E R V O R. Leap, um, write down in the comments if you have any idea what that spells, cause I don't know. Uh, even more fervor, fever, at the news of the Soviets' advance on Berlin. 
Conrad Volkov had sent his troops through the borderlands, and they were fighting the Germans in Nazi Poland. With Germany under attack and New Berlin in frames, Richmond Balder had fled to Hedesburg, formerly Philadelphia, and tried to regroup there, but a group of rebels had followed him and bombed his convoy. Balder was dead, now dead, and his staff hurried to control the territories without him. The Nazi troops had been de deployed across the country, and thousands had been arrested already, and just recently, a fat bounty had been placed on the head of Dieter's killer, a million Reichmark reward over Zara's head. After Zara had fallen asleep in the bunker, the Alliance had taken the assassination footage and arranged another broadcast on Channel 713. The Nazis had pulled the feed once they, once they caught wind of it, but the damage had been done and was already spreading. Now, there was a bounty out on Zara, along with her accomplices, Uncle Red, Aline, Bastion. Initially, there had been one place on Garrison on two, but it, it was rescinded after her arrest. Zara had gone to bed just as another Queen Bahrain had and had arisen at the face of the alliance as the face of the alliance. Any questions? Murdoch asked her, and Bastion when he'd finished his report. Garrison was arrested, Zara whispered, her face draining of color. He was caught on the way to the bunker, Murdoch said grimly. We're doing our best to break him out though. I want to help if I can. That's not possible, I'm afraid. Not with that reward on your head. But I'll keep you updated. What happened to Johan, Dieter's son? Bastian said. Disappeared. We think we's hide. We think he's hiding in, in with his mother in Germany proper. <laughs> bidding bidding their time until Jonah comes of age. <laughs> Jeez, I was playing with something. Now I gotta fix. Okay, there we go. Disappeared. We think he's hiding in the, with his mother in Germany proper somewhere. Biding their time until Jonah can come age. Age. Bastian asked how how he could track down his mother, and but Zara could only stand or had her hands. That hands had ended the Führer's life, the face of, for, of the Alliance. For so long, she had learned to be a part, any part, of the Revolutionary Alliance. But now she found herself at its very center. She didn't know what to think about that, except to cringe at the thought of her likeness splayed, ac splayed across TV screens and printed on every newspaper. And the following... In the days following, she walked around the bunker in a daze while every rebel asked to shake her hand or wanted to discuss the details of the assassination. She, bu she busied herself with a never-ending task that filled the bunker. Recruitment levels had skyrocketed, and Murdoch was, was quick to order more guerrilla attacks, more bombings, more destruction. The Nazis have had the weapons and their sentinels, but they were divided on two war fronts, and the alliance had the manpower inv advantage. The rebels chewed at the legs of the Grand Empire like tiny snakes. A lone serpent was easily crushed, but a horde of them was deadly. Garrison had been right all along. The Alliance merely needed to catalyst to a, a cat a list to an ignite a revolution. That was why that was why that was why it pained Zara that he wasn't here to witness it. After the White House mission, he and hundreds of other rebels were still missing. Zara often thought of him, along with Christy and her mother. She hoped they had made it to a safe house somewhere, but there was no way of knowing it with communication so spotty. But two weeks after the assassination, the Alliance finally discovered what happened to Garrison. The, Nazi bro the Nazis broadcast his execution on se Channel 7, decreeing him a, a rebel spy and beating him on live television. When they had, f had their fill of kicking him, the Germans, dra the Germans dragged Garrison to his feet and tied him to a wooden post. But he didn't finch once. And he didn't close his eyes when the firing squad took their place. He stared at them instead, his chin tipped high, his face defiant until the end. Mercifully, it had been a quick death. Zara was grateful for that when she saw the footage. Her uncle had told her to look away when the guns fired, but she kept her eyes open, like Garrison had in his very last moments. She felt like she owed, him, owed that to him somehow. Once Garrison's body crumpled, Zara finally buried her face in her uncle. Her face against her uncle's shoulder. The Alliance may have started a revolution, but it had lost one of its brightest members. A stream of tears slid down her cheeks for Garrison, for the others who died with him. With the war only beginning, Zara knew that there would be many more to come. And that is the end of chapter 23. And I don't got much to say. Like, subscribe, and comment down below.
and I'll see you guys in the next video.